How is everyone doing? Awesome. Well, give me a snap if you've ever worked as a car mechanic. Cool. Two people. That's what I thought. What about your parents or grandparents? Sweet. The freshman year of high school, I had the pleasure and honor of being a car mechanic at Toyota. Being from Peru, where laws are more of a suggestion than the law, um, I had access to working 40, 50 hours a week under 90 degrees every single day, dripping sweat. In high school, I was very blessed to have a high, GDP, a high GPA of 4.0. I was the president of the Music Honor Society, Business Honor Society. I was in student government cabinet and varsity tennis team and all these accomplishments that a high schooler would have dreamed of. However, there was a hole. There was a passion that was missing. There was something in my heart and in my spirit that wasn't fulfilled. In this time when I was a teenager in high school, my mom, Julia, decided to start a nonprofit called Pan Peru, which means Bread Peru, that builds libraries to promote education in rural Peru, because over 20% of the population in Peru lives in extreme poverty. And I was a teenager, and I was working, I was studying really hard, I was playing tennis, and I questioned my mom, Mom, why are you doing this? Why are you investing so much time, money, sweat, words and, and helping kids in, 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 the, in Pampas Grande and the highlands of Peru, why don't you use that money and buy me a guitar instead? <laughs> My mom gave me that look, and I was like, snap. <laughs> and she said, well, it is better to give than to receive, Pedro. I said, really? Do you still believe in that? Who believes in that anyway? That's in the Bible. Who goes to church anyway? She's like, no, it is better to serve others. I was like, I don't buy it. Prove me wrong, she said. Go to Pampas Grande, volunteer building the library, and prove me wrong. Well, that's how the journey started. I was a 14, 15 year old Peruvian high school student, and I traveled nine hours in the car climbing the, the black uh, mountain range of Peru uh, near Huaraz, 13,000 feet above sea level going through the illnesses of Soroche, which is high altitude sickness, and finally getting to the pueblo of Pampas Grande, which has no access to internet, no access to telephone, it had no access to even tap water. There were hundreds of kids, so heartwarming, hospitable, and while we were building the library at this nonprofit, I befriended a couple of them, and one of them was a little girl, 11-year-old, named Juana. And while we were building the bridge and mingling and helping each other and eating breakfast together, I asked her, Juana, ¿qué quieres hacer cuando seas grande? What do you aspire to be when you grow up? She looked at me and she said, I have no other choice. I can only be a farmer, like my mom, like my dad, like my grandma and like my grandpa. And when she shared these words, I felt so intrigued. My heart started burning. I was like, man, if she had access to a computer, or even a library, or a book, or Wi-Fi, or an iPhone, or anything, she would have so much many more other opportunities. And after volunteering this week session in Pampas Grande in Huaraz in Peru, I came back to my high school, the American School of Lima, and I shared this with my two older sisters, Diana and Karina. I told them, Karina, Diana, this is what happened. I volunteered, mom challenged me to go beyond my comfort zone, and I faced a reality that millions of kids, not only in Peru, but in many other developing countries in South America, in Asia, and Africa face every single day. Diana told me, do something about it. Start something. So, well, I was, okay, I take your challenge as well. I'm, not, I'm gonna use my, my network and my influence as a student government leader, business honor society leader and tennis player to start a club called Yatai, which in Quechua means to share, to play. And so 
basically, we would fundraise every week with bake sales, and we would start buying instruments. So we could go to Pampas Grande every three months in the mountains of Peru, 13,000 feet above sea level, and close the gap between the rich kids of Lima going to the American school and the real kids from rural Peru that have no access to a single book. So we did this, thankfully, with the support of the president of my high school, the principal, teachers, the Music Honor Society, the business clubs, and everything. And little by little, everyone, including myself, we, we realized the huge necessity that there was in rural Peru, not only in Pampas Grande, but in many other districts and pueblos in Peru. And little by little, I started discovering my passion, which was serving others and community service and creating a platform or a club to help people make a difference. Something very, very different from the 13-year-old Pedro that used to avoid going to community service hours in school. And so this whole story was my college application for UC Berkeley. I wrote about this story of me starting this club of community service and sponsoring education and teaching kids how to play the guitar, the piano, and Pampas Grande. And thankfully, UC Berkeley was the only school that accepted me. I got rejected by UC Davis, UCSB, Boston University, Miami, every single school. I think I applied to 20 schools. Only Berkeley accepted me with the merit-based scholarships. And in the interview, they questioned me, Pedro, this whole experience of helping Juana and her pueblo have a, have a library, why don't you create a repeatable business model? Why don't you convert it into a social venture? Why don't you make it into an organization? And I looked at my interviewer. I was like, man, that's not a bad idea at all. And I was like, but I'm new. I'm from Peru. I'm 17. I'm 18. I'm a freshman in UC Berkeley. I don't know anyone in California. So I started going outside of my comfort zone. I started learning how to play golf, how to play like these different sports and like just to like, you know, pitch, pitch to investors because let's be honest, the vast majority of venture capitalists in San Francisco and Silicon Valley are playing tea time in Stanford and, and all these, you know, country clubs. So I did it. And it was hilarious because my best friend, his name is Lucho, he's a, he's a ranked golfer in Peru. And I would always mock him. I would be like, golf is not a real sport. You don't even sweat. But I fell in love with the sport. And so right before going to college, starting college in 2013 at UC Berkeley, I decided to return to Pampas Grande, this Pueblo 13,000 feet above sea level, where my mom was born. And by this time, we had not only built one library, but the nonprofit Pamperu, received funding by Primax, which acquired Shell in Peru, um, Toyota Peru, Honda Peru, and a bunch of other corporations in Lima, Peru, and other major cities. And they built several greenhouses, libraries, computer labs, and the whole Pueblo was developing. The Pueblo that didn't even have a police department now had a library. And we were inaugurating one of the newest greenhouses, and all of a sudden, I hear a knock in the back of the door. And it was Juana. This time, she was not 11. She was 14, 15 years old. And she said, Pedro, Pedro. I was like, hey, long time no see. <laughs> and she was like, ya sé lo que quiero estudiar. I know what I want to major in. I know what I want to be in the future. I said, what? Hit me up. What's up? She said, I want to be an engineer. I want to build bridges. I want to connect my pueblo Pampas Grande with the capital of the state and improve lives, bring infrastructure to our country. And as she was saying these words, I was like, man, I was almost like crying. I was like, this is so inspiring. I was like, if nonprofits receive the adequate help from companies and people and volunteers, they can make a difference in the community. And so this story of meeting Juana and her whole transformation from having no access to Wi-Fi to having access to encyclopedias, to Wi-Fi, to telephone lines, to tap water, really motivated me to start Smiley Go. And Smiley Go 
is a platform that helps companies create a social impact to nonprofits. We're providing all the data and information of every single 501c3 nonprofit in the US for companies to quantify their measurement and their impact of their grants and donations. And thankfully, I was able to start partnerships with the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. I, we started helping and working with Dropbox and many other companies and nonprofits that wanted to make a difference in the US and the world. We even reached a point of having a coverage of 42 countries and over 190 smiley goers, volunteers, in, in, in the world. And this was a great experience for me as a student founder in UC Berkeley, starting a social enterprise that would help people make impact. However, the most important part of, of this whole experience that I learned and of the speech wasn't getting venture capital funding from 1517 for Smiley Go. It wasn't hiring 30 employees that were older than me in San Francisco. It wasn't receiving scholarships from UC Berkeley and Stanford to be educated. The most important lesson I learned was to serve people. And I couldn't prove my mom wrong. I figured out it was certainly better and greater to serve others, to give, than to receive. And that's the number one lesson I learned as a young entrepreneur, that if serving is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. And my mom laughed. <laughs> she was like, well, I told you so. And now at my 23 years of age, I am learning every day to become a better leader, a better listener, a better speaker, and when I go to Pampas Grande, where my mom was born, when, when my, where my grandpa was born, and he was mayor of the pueblo, I have that joy and that vision that with technology and with startups that are helped with amazing programs like the Holt Prize and many other amazing programs in the world, we can truly make a social impact in the world. And it's no longer called social entrepreneurship. It's just called entrepreneurship. It's called innovation. It's called what we are. Millennials have that in our DNA. We were born and we were raised serving others, doing community service, filling out the cast for AP and IB programs and everything. And I believe that if we embrace that mindset that we can totally go beyond our comfort zone and we can go out and start building bridges, we can go way, way further. So my number one question for you all today is, what bridge will you start building? What bridge will you build this year? What bridge will you build today? Will it be a bridge of compassion, of love, of selfishness, of hatred? Or would it be a, a bridge of helping others, a bridge of unity, in the midst of the political crisis, in the midst of the economic recession, in the midst of the potential World War III? Where are we spending our time in? That's the dilemma and that's the mindset that I face every day, every hour, and every minute. As I travel every week for work and meet with investors and writing a book about diversity and how immigrants create a competitive advantage for the US GDP, I don't do it for myself. I don't do it like, yeah, I have to build my own kingdom. Yes, I have to do this and that. I have to get this press release. I have to do a book interview with the CFO of eBay. I do it for something higher. I do it for a greater purpose. I do it beyond myself. I think of not only the kids in Peru, but I think of even like the whole world. Like We all need help and we can all help. Many times, Wealthy people, some wealthy people, are so poor that the only thing they have is money. And there's no excuse for not helping others. We all have time, and time is our greatest asset and the most beautiful gift a person can devote and give to you. So I encourage everyone to go outside of your comfort zone and make a social impact. 
hug one another, be thankful for where we are. This is a beautiful auditorium. It's a beautiful campus and a beautiful city and a great country that opened its doors to my family. So I encourage you all to build a bridge. And thank you so much. <laughs>